Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful day of camp meeting that you have given us. How wonderful it is for your family to get together to sing praises to your name, to hear your voice through preaching, and to speak with you through prayer. We ask that as we open your word, that your Holy Spirit will be with us, that you will enlighten our minds, that you will soften our hearts, and you will empower us to give a good witness that we are followers of Jesus. We thank you for the privilege of prayer and for hearing us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> During his earthly ministry, Jesus had many theological battles with the Pharisees. But he also had battles with the Sadducees who sought to entrap Jesus in apparently insolvable dilemmas. Once the Apostle Paul was speaking in a certain place to a group that had Sadducees and Pharisees, and when the Apostle Paul spoke about the resurrection, there was dissension between these two Jewish sects. Let's read about it in Acts chapter 23 and verses 7 through 9. Acts 23 verses 7 through 9. It says, And when he had said this, when he had spoken about the resurrection, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. It's kind of like uh, the churches today. See, Adventists have controversy with Sunday keepers because we keep the Sabbath. We all claim to be Christians. You know, Adventists believe that the dead know nothing, whereas many churches believe that the dead know everything. And so in the times of Christ, these Jewish sects, they were all Jews, but they had different belief systems. Ellen White confirmed what Acts 23 tells us about the Sadducees and the resurrection. In Desire of Ages, page 603, she wrote, the Sadducees denied the existence of angels, the resurrection of the dead, and the doctrine of a future life with its rewards and punishments. Now, why did the Sadducees deny the resurrection? Why did they teach that there was no resurrection? Well, there were basically two reasons. The first reason is that according to them, re a resurrection would be contrary to observable scientific principles. It's the same argument that is used by liberal Christian theologians today, which they call the principle of analogy, and that is that if we don't see resurrections from the dead today, they did not exist in the past either. For the Sadducees, it was impossible for a body that had been decomposed and was in the tomb to reintegrate it and resurrect it from the dead. So basically, they said, resurrections are contrary to science. Ellen White wrote in Desire of Ages, page 537 and 538, about this objection to the resurrection. She stated, they did not believe in a resurrection of the dead, producing so-called science. They had reasoned that it would be an impossibility for a dead body to be brought to life. So, because of so-called science, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. But there was a second reason. The second reason is that the Sadducees only accepted as fully inspired the five books of Moses. And they could not find the doctrine of the resurrection in the first five books of the Bible. And so they said, if it's not in the first five books of the Bible, which we accept as fully inspired, we cannot accept the doctrine of the resurrection. 
uh, the theologian R.C. Sproul wrote the following words about this. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead, for we do not find the resurrection taught explicitly in the first five books of the Bible. So the Sadducees rejected the resurrection, first, because they considered it unscientific, and secondly, because they could not find it in the Pentateuch in the first five books of the Bible, known as the Law of Moses. And so these Sadducees came to Jesus once, and they wanted to ridicule his belief in the resurrection. And they presented an absurd, preposterous, and hypothetical case of seven brothers who married the same woman. After telling the story, they asked Jesus whose wife this woman would be in the resurrection because she had seven husbands. And by the way, they used the writings of Moses to defend their view of what is known as leveret marriage. If a brother died and they did not leave a posterity, it was according to Moses that his brother had to marry his wife and give him posterity. Let's read the passage about the encounter with, uh, of the Sadducees with Jesus. Luke 20, verses 27 to 33. This is the scenario that they present to Jesus. Luke 20, 27 to 33. Then some of the Sadducees, who deny that there is a resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote, what do they use as their authority? Moses, yes. And by the way, the reference, Bible reference is Deuteronomy 25 and verse 5. This is the text that they're referring to. So once again, then some of the Sadducees, who deny that there is a resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies having a wife and he dies without children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers and the first took a wife and died without children. And the second took her, second took her as wife and he died childless. Then the third took her and in like manner, the seven also, and they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife does she become? <laughs> they want to put Jesus between a rock and a hard place. But they don't understand whom they're dealing with. Now, Jesus responds in two points. Those two points are not mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, but they're mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew. So save your place there, and let's go to Matthew chapter 22 and verse 29. Matthew 22 and verse 29 gives us the two reasons, and then Jesus is going to add a third reason. It says in Matthew 22 verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Jesus is saying, you think that Moses did not mention the resurrection? Well, you are mistaken because Moses did refer to the resurrection of the dead. So you are mistaken. You don't even understand the scriptures that you profess to believe in. And then Jesus says, nor the power of God. In other words, you limit the power of God by saying that God isn't powerful enough to resurrect the dead. But God is almighty. He can reintegrate the dead, and he can resurrect them from the dead. So you ignore the scriptures. You are mistaken also because you deny the power of God. But then Jesus gave a third reason. And in this third reason... He says, your example is irrelevant because in the kingdom come, there is not going to be any marriage. 
So your example is irrelevant. This uh, woman is not going to be married to any of the seven brothers. Let's read the response of Jesus in Luke 20, beginning with verse 33. Luke 20 and verse 33, and we'll read through verse 38. Jesus answered and said to them, The sons of this age, what did Jesus mean when he said this age? Those who live in the present time, right? In this world now, in this world of sin. The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age, that is the age to come after the resurrection, and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So he's saying, folks, your example is irrelevant because in the life to come, there is not going to be any marriage. And let me just interject here uh, that marriage was established by God for this world, for a specific purpose. You see, in the other worlds, there is not procreation. Only in this world. Ellen White has several statements where she says that the purpose of procreation was to replace the vacancies that were left by Satan and his angels in heaven when they fell. But when Jesus comes, that purpose will have been fulfilled. And so there will be no marriage in the kingdom come. Ellen White makes that absolutely clear. She said there will be no marriages in the kingdom come. But now Jesus transitions. He said, you don't understand the scriptures. You deny the power of God. Your example is irrelevant because there's not going to be ma any marriage in the kingdom come. And then Jesus now speaks about their misunderstanding of the writings of Moses. Notice what it says in verse 37. But even Moses, why does he use the word even? <laughs> He's saying, listen, the Moses you, you claim to believe in, even Moses showed in the burning bush passage, where is Jesus getting his answer from? From the writings of Moses, because if he had used any other reference, they would have said, we don't accept those as inspired. So Jesus says, you claim to believe in Moses, in the writings of Moses? Well, let me quote Moses to you. And so once again, but even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised. In other words, Moses in Exodus chapter 3, shows that he believed in the resurrection of the dead. When he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now you say, where, where do you have a reference to the resurrection there? It simply says that Moses wrote that uh, the Lord is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, it gets even more complicated in verse 38. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So Jesus seems to be saying that at that moment, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were alive. But we know that they were dead in the time of Moses. They had passed away. So what is it that Jesus is saying when he states, for God is not a God of the dead, but of the living. We know that at that time, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were dead. Ah, the next verse, verse 38, the end of verse 38 has the answer. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For all live to him, not to us. All live to whom? To God. All live to him. Not to us. Now you say, what does this mean? Let me read you this statement from Ellen White. Remarkable statement. Where Ellen White is commenting on this passage. 
Desire of Ages, page 606. God counts the things that are not as though they were. God what? Counts the things that for us are not as though they were. He sees the end from the beginning and behold, beholds the result of his work as though it were now accomplished. The precious dead, from Adam down to the last saint who dies, will hear the voice of the Son of God and will come forth, that's our perspective, by the way, will come forth from the grave to immortal life. God will be their God. That's our perspective, future. God will be their God, and they shall be his people. There will be a close and tender relationship between God and the risen saints. By using the future tense, she's saying that for us, God is going to have this intimate relationship with the redeemed. But now notice, this condition, which is anticipated in his purpose, he beholds as if it were already existing. What? You see, for what us is a promise, for God is a done deal. We'll come back to that. So once again, she writes, this condition which is anticipated in his purpose, he beholds as if it were already existing. The dead live unto him. The dead live unto whom? Unto God. Now let me explain a little bit this as best as I can. For us time-bound creatures, that which has been done and that which will be done are two different things. What has been done is past, and what will be done is future. However, God is not time-bound as we are. That which is potential for us is actual for God. For God, potentiality is actuality. That is to say, in the mind of God, things exist before they come into actual existence. God looks at the broad panorama of eternity as transpiring before his view in the present. For this reason, in Acts 15, verse 18, we find these remarkable words. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Known to God from all eternity are all his works. Although time is important for God, in contrast to us, he lives, as it were, in an eternal present. After all, the Bible calls him the I am, not the I was or the I will be. Now, when the Bible says that God states, I was, I am, and I will be, he's using our way of thinking, our relationship with time. Now, let's notice the passage that Jesus quoted from the writings of Moses. Exodus 3, verse 6 and then we'll jump down to verses 13 and 14. Exodus 3, verse 6. This is when the Lord appears to Moses in the burning bush. Moreover, he said, I am. He doesn't say I was. I am the God of your father. The God of Abraham. The God of Isaac. And the God of Jacob. Now, wait a minute. They were dead. So how, how could God say, I am, not I was while they were alive, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Let's go to verses 13 and 14. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? 
And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am refers to an eternal present. Now notice another remarkable statement from the writings of Ellen White. Manuscript releases, volume 14, pages 22 and 23. Manuscript releases, pages, volume 14, pages 22 and 23. She's explaining what I am means. I am means an eternal presence. The past, the present, and the future are alike to God. Let me ask you, are the past, present, and future alike to us? No, but she says, I am means an eternal presence. The past, present, and future are alike to God. He sees the most remote events of past history and the far distant future with as clear a vision as we do those things that are transpiring daily. You know, when I presented this sermon, people are kind of puzzled. I said, never heard this before. But it's what the Bible and the spirit of prophecy teach. You say, where does the Bible teach such a thing? Well, first of all, we have the passage from Luke 20, where it says that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were already dead. But we have further evidence. Go with me to Genesis 17, verses 4 and 5. Genesis 17 and verses 4 and 5. This is before Isaac was born. Through Isaac, many descendants were going to be given to Abraham. Now notice Genesis 17, and we'll read verse 4, and then there's a change in verse 5. Verse 4 says, As for me, God is speaking to Abraham, As for me, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Whose time reference is that? You shall be a father of many nations. That's Abraham's perspective. It's future. But now notice the very next verse. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Are you catching the difference? Verse 4 says, I will make you a father of many nations. That's Abraham's perspective. But then in the next verse he says, I have made you a father of many nations. In other words, for me it's a done deal. For you, it's future. For me, it's present. You can take it to the bank. Now you say, well, maybe you're just stretching the text, Pastor Boy. Well, let's see what the Apostle Paul had to say about this passage. Go with me to Romans chapter 4 and verse 17. Romans chapter 4 and verse 17. Here Paul is referring to the verses that we just read from Genesis chapter 17. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our father in the presence of God whom he believed. The God who makes the dead alive, by the way, that's a reference to uh, Hebrew, it's referred to in Hebrews 11 verse 12, where it says that the body of Abraham was as good as dead <laughs> at this point. He was beyond child. Uh, producing age. And so it says, He is our Father in the presence of God whom He believed, the God who makes the dead alive and summons the things that do not yet exist as though they already do. Is my assessment correct? The Apostle Paul says, absolutely. Now let me read you a couple of translations that make this even clearer. The New English translation, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our father in the presence of God whom he believed. The God who makes the dead alive 
and summons the things that do not yet exist as though they already do. The Weymouth translation reads like this, Thus, in the sight of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and makes reference to things that do not exist as though they did. Abraham, Abraham is the father of us all, as it is written, I have appointed you to be the forefather of many nations. The great Bible commentator, Presbyterian Bible commentator from long ago, Albert Barnes, explained Romans 4.17 in the following words. That is, those things which God foretells and promises are so certain that he may speak of them as already in existence. Thus, in relation to Abraham, God, instead of simply promising that he would make him the father of many nations, speaks of it as already done. I have made thee. In his own mind or purpose, God had so constituted him, and it was so certain that it would take place that he might speak of it as already done. What for us is promise, for God is a done deal. We can take God's promises to the bank because God sees everything as if it were present. And God knows exactly what's going to happen. Now, let's take another biblical example. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13 and verse 8. Revelation 13 and verse 8. It's speaking about those who are going to worship the beast at the end of time. And it says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Now for us, when did Jesus die? He died in the year 31, the month of Nisan, the 14th day, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But not for God, because it says the Lamb from the foundation of the world. From our perspective, us who are captive of time, this happened in the past. But for God, who lives in an eternal present, Jesus was already sacrificed before the foundation of the world. Now, let me read you a statement from Ellen White. The Faith I Live By, which is a devotional book, page 77. The covenant of grace is not a new truth, for it existed in the mind of God from all eternity. This is why it is called the everlasting covenant. Now, Peter understood this. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, he presents both perspectives, ours and God's. Notice 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. Speaking about Jesus, it says, He indeed was foreordained. By the way, that's the Greek word proginosko o. We're going to refer to that word in a little while, proginosko, which means to know something in advance. So basically, he was indeed foreordained which means it was known in advance, before the foundation of the world. Whose perspective of time is that? God's. But now notice the last half of the verse. But was manifest in these last days, these last times, for whom? For us. So, in other words, he was foreknown in the mind of God from eternity past, but he was manifested for us when Jesus came to this earth and died for our sins. The Apostle Paul understood the same thing. Notice Titus chapter 1 and verses 2 and 3. Titus chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. It says, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Whose perspective is that? God's perspective. 
he promised from eternity past, but has in due time manifested. That's our point of view. Manifested his word through preaching, which was committed uh, to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. So you have two perspectives of time. God did not have to wait for Jesus to die on the cross. He lives in an eternal present. He saw it as clearly in the past as he did when Jesus was dying on the cross because he lives in an eternal present. Don't ask me to explain that because I'm a slave of time. I have to look at my watch to see when I'm supposed to end my sermon tonight. I wish I had God's time to preach. <laughs> now, let's notice another example. When are our names written in the book of life? Well, let's read Revelation 17 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 8. It's speaking of here about the beast that rises from the bottomless pit. And it says there, the beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written. By the way, the tense of the verb is a perfect tense, which a better translation would be, whose names have not been written. Whose names have not been written in the book of life, from when? From the foundation of the world. When were the names of the wicked not written in the book, book of life? From the foundation of the world. So when are the names of God's people, God's faithful people, written in the book of life? From the foundation of the world. And you're saying, ooh, pastor, you get into predestination here. Yeah, we're going to deal with that. We're going to talk about an easy way to explain predestination. It's not rocket science. We don't have to be King Solomon in order to understand the issue of predestination. All we need to understand is what we're studying this evening. Let's notice in the book, the uh, devotional book, God's Amazing Grace, page 143, Ellen White seems to contradict the Bible. I emphasize the word seems, okay? She says there, that our names are written in the book of life when we get baptized. So Ellen White contradicts the Bible, right? Wrong. When we understand this concept, we'll understand that Ellen White and the Bible are in harmony. You know, people are critical of Ellen White because they don't study hard enough. You know, seeming contrary. For example, you know, how did Judas die? Well, if you read... The, the book of Acts, it says that he fell headlong and his belly exploded and his innards came out. Whereas in Matthew, it says that he went and hung himself. And so they see the Bible contradicts itself because it, it says different things about how Judas died. Ellen White reconciles the two ideas perfectly. She says that Judas was the heaviest of the disciples. And there was a branch that was hanging over a cliff where he was going to hang himself. And because he was heavy, the rope broke, and he fell a long distance, his belly split open, and then his innards came out. Perfect explanation. But people find contradictions in the Bible that are not there. They find, supposedly, contradictions in the writings of Ellen White that are not there. Study hard. If you find what seems to be a contradiction, keep searching. Go beyond that text to everything that Ellen G. White wrote. I stand amazed as I stand here before you at the profound theological knowledge that Ellen G. White had. There's two kinds of people with regards to Ellen White that criticize her. Number one, those who never read her. And number two, number two those who read her with the intention of criticizing. Now let me read you this state from, uh, statement from God's Amazing Grace, page 143. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. How many persons? Three. I didn't hear you. 
three. Because a third person is being questioned these days. Now, Ellen White says, you know, I can't explain the Holy Spirit. I know the Holy Spirit's a person. He's one of the three members of the Godhead. He's as much God as the Father and the Son. But Ellen White says that we cannot explain the nature of the Holy Spirit. It's a mystery. She says, silence is golden. We know a lot about the Father. We know a lot about the Son in the Bible. Holy Spirit has an element of mystery to him. We accept it by faith. But don't deny uh, that there is a Holy Spirit. By the way, we can know the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We can see the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Like you can't see the wind, but you can see the wind moving the tree. And so we can study the effects of the Holy Spirit on the human heart. We can study about the gifts of the Spirit, and we can study about the fruit of the Spirit. Now, how did I get off on this tangent? Let's go back to the quotation. <clears throat> the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, powers infinite and omniscient, receive those who truly enter into covenant relationship with God. They are present at every baptism. Who's present at every baptism? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To receive the candidates who have renounced the world and have received Christ into the soul temple. These candidates, candidates means that they're going to be baptized, right? These candidates have entered into the family of God and their names are inscribed in the Lamb's book of life. When were their names inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life? When they were baptized. Well, wait a minute. We noticed that the names are inscribed from the foundation of the world. So how do we resolve this? This seeming contradiction between Revelation 13, verse 8, and Ellen White's statement is resolved when we recognize that Revelation 13, verse 8 refers to God's eternal foreknowledge about who would accept Christ and be baptized. Whereas Ellen White is speaking about the moment when that, from our perspective, became a reality. Are you with me or not? Throughout eternity, God foreknew who would choose to accept the atonement and those who would not accept the atonement. In other words, God from eternity past knew the choices that people would make, but he did not make those choices for them. I'm going to read that again. From eternity past, God knew the choices that people would make, but he did not make those choices for them. God did not say in eternity past, by divine decree, I choose this one group to be saved and I choose this other group to be lost. Tough luck for those who are lost. They have no choice in the matter. God did not do that. God simply foreknew who would choose him and having that foreknowledge, he elected them. You see, there's a difference between predestination and predetermination. God predestined us to salvation because he foreknew the choice that we would make. God predestined us based on our choice, not on his. God elected individuals on the basis of his foreknowledge of the choices that people would make. Now, the word foreknowledge appears twice in the New Testament. And a related word, the verbal form, appears five times. The two words are prognosis. What word do we get in English from prognosis? <laughs> what is a prognosis? It is to announce something that seemingly we believe is going to happen, right? And the other one is prognosco. It's the identical word, but the verbal form. Two times prognosis. Five times, prognosco. Now, we don't have time to read all of these uh, statements, but basically the words mean knowing something in advance. It means a forecast 
this is the dictionary now, a forecast of the likely outcome of a situation. When a person goes to the doctor because the person is feeling bad, the doctor gives a what? Detects the disease and gives a prognosis of what will happen to the pa patient in the future, right? Now he might say, sorry to say, you have six months to live because of the disease that you have. He gives a prognosis. The problem with the doctor is that the doctor does not live in eternity, so he's giving a guess of what is going to happen. You know, another example is weather casters. They are the only profession where you can be wrong half the time and still keep your job. <laughs> they give a prognosis of the weather, but they make mistakes. But the word prognosis, as it is used of God, means that God, 100% of the time, can see what is going to happen, and there is no variation from what he sees. Let's notice a couple of texts that use the word prognosis. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We read this before, but let's read it again. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now notice this very important part of the, uh, of the verse, verse 2. Elect according to what? Ah, prognosis. On what basis does God elect someone? On the basis of his what? On the basis of his foreknowledge. On the basis of knowing the choice that the person will make. It continues saying, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Notice also Acts chapter 2 and verses 22 and 23. Here it's used with regards to the suffering and death of Christ. Let me ask you, did God already see the death of Christ as if it were present in eternity past? We notice that, right? So now notice Acts 2, 22 and 23. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose, Jesus was delivered by the determined purpose or by God's plan, and what? and foreknowledge of God. That's the word prognosis. Could God prognosticate what was going to happen with Jesus so that we could understand it? Yes, but did God have to wait for it to happen? No, God did not have to wait for it to happen. So it says, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Now let's notice a couple of verses. We don't have time to read all five of them. A couple of verses that use the word prognoskoo, which is the verbal form of prognosis. Let's go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. This is probably the clearest verse that we can read on the issue of God's foreknowledge and how it relates to election and predestination. It says there, for whom he foreknew, that's the word, proginosko, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Are you catching the point? Whom God foreknew in eternity past, that was going to respond to the atonement, was going to receive Jesus Christ as Savior, what did he do? He predestined. In other words, he doesn't predestine way back here and say, tough luck, you know, of all human beings, I'm going to save this group and I'm going to condemn the other group. That's not the way it works. On the basis of his foreknowledge, he predestined 
a group to be saved because he knew what their choice would be. Now notice what he continues saying. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, whom he predestined on the basis of what? Of his foreknowledge, that's the context, whom he predestined, these he also what? Called. Whom he called, these also he justified, and whom he justified, these also he glorified. Are you understanding this? It's not that difficult to understand. Now let me give you a couple of biblical examples. God announced before the birth of Jacob and Esau exactly what they were going to be like. And some people have puzzled over this because God said, the older will serve the younger. I loved Jacob and I hated Esau before they were born. So what happens is that God said, Esau, tough luck. You know, you're going to be born and I predestined you to, you know, you know to sell your birthright. And Jacob, you're my favorite, so you're going to get the birthright. Is that the way it works? Absolutely not. Let's notice what we find in the Spirit of Prophecy. Volume 1, Spirit of Prophecy, page 106. Did God know from eternity past what the character of Jacob and what the character of Esau would be like? Did he foreknow that? Yes. On that basis, on the basis of what, what Jacob would decide, did God, because of his foreknowledge, elect him? Yes or no? Yes. Was his election arbitrary? No. Was it predetermined? No. When we understand that God lives in an eternal present, he knows what choices people are going to make. And so he can announce long before it happens what's going to occur because God lives in an eternal present. Notice the statement of Ellen White. God knows the end from the beginning. What? I can't explain that. I can't predict what's going to happen tomorrow. In fact, I can't predict what's going to happen in the next couple of minutes. But God knows the end from the beginning. Now notice the number of times that Ellen White uses here, no, no. He knew before the birth of Jacob and Esau just what characters they would both develop. He knew that Esau would not have a heart to obey him. He answered the troubled prayer of Rebekah and informed her that she would have two children and the elder should serve the younger. He presented the future history of her two sons before her, that they would be two nations, the one greater than the other, and the elder should serve the younger. So from God's perspective, who lives in an eternal present, he could describe exactly the characters of Jacob and Esau without missing a single detail. Let's notice another biblical example. The betrayal of Jesus, Jesus by Judas. How did it work? God says to Judas, you know, I brought you into the world to betray Jesus. And Judas says, but what do I have to say? Tough luck. It's my choice. It's my sovereignty. I say you're going to betray Jesus, you're going to hang yourself. Is that the way it worked? No. In fact, it had been prophesied a thousand years before Judas did what he did, that he was going to do it. Who predicted that? God. For God was at present? Yes, because God sees the whole sweep of eternity in one glance in one view. And he announces certain things in prophecy that are going to take place for our benefit, who are captives of time. What is a promise for us 
is a done deal for God. That's great news. Don't miss tomorrow night. We're going to follow up on this tomorrow night on how we can trust the promises of God. Notice in Acts chapter 1 and verse 20. This is when the disciples are gathered together to elect a successor for Judas. And Peter is speaking. And Peter states this, for it is written in the book of Psalms. Now he's not mentioned by name. Let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. In other words, he wasn't going to come back home. And, this is Psalm 109, and let another take his office. Announced a thousand years before it happened. Because God in his foreknowledge knew the choices that Judas would make. Not because God determined those choices. Let me give you an illustration uh, that will help you understand this. I want you to imagine a train and the conductor of a train. The conductor is uh, driving the train, and he comes to a place where the tracks divide to the right and to the left. Now, who determines whether the train goes right or left? Well, there are two different ways in which it can happen. There can be someone in a booth next to the tracks that by remote control switches the tracks. In that sense, the conductor has nothing to say about the direction of the train. But there's another way in which it can happen. And that is that the conductor of the train has the remote control and can switch the tracks. In that sense, the conductor is in control of which track the train goes. God is not sitting in a booth so to speak, and when one individual reaches the uh, place where the tracks divide into salvation or perdition, God says, saved, lost, saved, lost. No, God gives us the remote to decide which track we're going to go on. Does God already know which track we are going to choose to take. He knows, but he does not determine it outside the train. He gives us the freedom of choice. Are you following me or not? Now, before we reach an end, you're not here by accident tonight. God knew from eternity past every single person who was going to be here and where you were going to sit. And what decision you were going to make. I want to refer particularly to those people who have not yet given their lives fully to Jesus Christ. God knew that you were going to be here tonight. And God was going to give you the opportunity to make a decision for Jesus tonight. He brought you here. It's not an accident. He knew it from eternity past. He knew the choice that you would make. Now, I travel a lot. I've traveled in just in one airline in the last few years, five million miles. That doesn't include all of the airlines I travel on. And, you know, people ask me, they say, Pastor Bohr, aren't you afraid of flying? And I say, no. Why should I be? Because the plane might fall. And I say, yeah, and what's the problem? You'll die. Okay, and what's the problem? I'm not afraid of dying because I'm in Christ. The Bible says that the dead in Christ will rise first. For God, it's a done deal. For me, if Jesus tarries, I'll just have to sleep a little while. But I don't have to worry, whether is it going to happen or isn't it going to happen? 
For God, it's a done deal. For me, it's a promise. For him, it already transpired. Isn't it wonderful to live on the basis of God's promises in that way? Let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 to 17. Actually, let's just read, for the brevity of time, a, a portion of this passage. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And now notice this. And the dead, what kind of dead? The dead in Christ will rise first. See, if you're in Christ, death means nothing. Because we're told here, the dead in Christ will rise first. Now here's the big question. How do we come to be in Christ? That's the big question. At what moment do we become one in Christ? I want to read our last couple of verses, and then I want to speak about this ceremony. Because I don't think that everyone who is here is a Seventh-day Adventist who has been baptized. In a crowd this large, undoubtedly there are people that have not accepted Jesus Christ and confirmed it through the rite of baptism. Notice Galatians chapter 3 and verses 26 to 28. Here the Apostle Paul wrote, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized, what? Into Christ have put on Christ. Those who have been what? Baptized into Christ. How do we come to be into, in Christ? Through baptism. In Christ have put on Christ at the moment of baptism is where we officially are in Christ. We become brothers and sisters of Jesus, and therefore we become sons and daughters of God. And baptism is not an option. And by the way, I'm talking about baptism the way the Bible does. Baptism by sprinkling is not baptism. And baptism of an infant is not biblical baptism. The Bible makes it clear that baptism has to be of a, of a person who understands what they're doing. They must repent of their sins. They must confess their sins. And they must trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And when they do that, and they are baptized, they are in Christ. Now somebody might say, why isn't sprinkling enough? Let me explain the reason why. We don't have a baptistry here. Uh, I don't think, at least. Uh, maybe you're going to have a baptism this coming Sabbath. But I'm sure that most of you have seen a Bible baptism. The pastor is in the baptismal tank, and the candidate is before him, and the pastor raises his arm and he says, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. What's the last thing that the candidate does before the pastor places the person under the water? They stop breathing. What happens while they're under the water? They don't breathe. What is the first thing they do when they come forth from the water? They breathe again. In miniature, they are re re reflecting the experience of Christ. Because on the cross, Jesus breathed his last. In the tomb, he did not breathe. And when he came forth from the tomb, he breathed again. In miniature, you are being introduced into the experience of Christ. Are you following me? Baptism is not simply a ceremony. It's the entrance into the family of God. It's the moment when a person becomes in Christ. And God foresaw the decisions that everybody would make this evening. I want to ask as I close, is there anyone here who has not experienced baptism? 
that would like to say, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and as my Lord. I want to prepare for baptism because you have to study in order to prepare for baptism to be sure about what you're doing. Is there anyone here who would like to say to the Lord Jesus, not to me, I would like to prepare for that glorious experience of baptism? Do you want to raise your hand this evening? I want to have a word of prayer for you. Anybody here? I guess we're all baptized. But somehow I suspect that we're not all baptized. Could I, could I have you stand, please? Could I have you stand? Why don't you come up here? I want to have you close. I want to have a word of prayer. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I know there are more people here. Anyone else want to join these two young men? God bless you. It's, it's music to my ears, and it warms my heart to see you here this evening. Anyone else want to join them before I have a word of prayer to ask the Lord to bless their decision? Don't harden your heart. As I said, God knew you were going to be here tonight. You were going to have the opportunity to make your decision for Jesus Christ. And I don't want to have a prayer until everyone who has felt the tug of the Holy Spirit will respond to the Lord's call. Just a few moments more, and I'm going to have a word of prayer for these two young men. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice oh, today, don't harden your hearts. Praise the Lord. I knew we had others. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. 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 There's others. You know, according to the clock, I only have two minutes. But we're on God's time now. <laughs> Anyone else want to respond to the call of the Holy Spirit? You know, this is not an obligation. Oh, it's so hard to stand in front of so many people. Folks, the Bible says that if we're ashamed of Jesus now, he will be ashamed of us later. So please respond before I have a word of prayer. Anyone else here? You know, children who have reached the age where they can understand, they can respond also. I know that they're not here now. They're probably in the tents. But parents, work on your children. Explain to your children these things. Prepare them for baptism. Teach them how important this ceremony is. 20 seconds. And I'm going to pray. Does anybody want to join this group? Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now we have the perfect number, seven. <laughs> Praise God. But 14 would be better. <laughs> or even more. Praise the Lord. God is working. His Spirit is working upon human hearts this evening. Well, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father of heaven, we come before your awesome throne. Thank you because you live in an eternal presence. Thank you because you don't have to wait until things occur because you know the end from the beginning. Thank you that what is a promise to us is a done deal for you. I thank you and praise you for these precious souls that have responded to this call. It's not easy to stand in front of a congregation like this, but someday we're going to have to stand for you in very difficult circumstances. I ask that you will bless these precious souls that very soon they will be buried in the waters of baptism, be in Christ, and witness for you. We thank you, Father, for having been with us and for answering our prayer, for we ask it in the precious and most holy name of Jesus. Amen.